And this is the first session of the meeting, the 64th annual AUR meeting. And the first couple of lectures, the sessions that we have this morning will all be those from the APDR. So the first session is on hot topics. And the first talk that we'll be having, we'll be having here today will be from Dr. Robbins, and they'll be talking about the annual surveys. The, he'll be giving us the results of the fall survey, and then Dr. Angelisa Paladin from the University of Washington will be giving the results of the spring survey. I just want to remind you that the um, cell phone should be off or silenced during the session. The talks cannot be recorded, and um, we will hold the questions until the end of the session so we can try and keep on time. So our first speaker then is Mark Robbins. He's from Case Western Reserve. Thanks. Good morning. Welcome to San Diego. This is the uh, hot topic session. And I hope besides going to 7 a.m. conferences, you have a little bit of time for recreation like these guys at La Jolla Coast. And uh, I'll be presenting the fall results. Uh, and Dr. Uh, Angelisa Paladin will present the uh, spring results of the survey. The main focus of the fall survey was the milestones and CCC and, and mainly program director support. I want to big up, give a big shout out to thanks to everybody on the annual survey committee. They do an incredible amount of work. I'm certainly the weakest link here and I want to thank Dr. Uh, uh, Paladin for co-chairing and everyone on the committee. So in addition to doing two surveys a year, we've been trying to get the word out of what program directors think. This is our second publication, which is in 2015. And we just found out from, from Anna that uh, uh, what program directors think part three was just accepted on Friday. So you'll see that in press in the next couple of months. So we try to get over 100 participants in the survey uh, for validity. And you can see on the slide the distribution of programs and responses pretty much along the lines the way programs are distributed uh, in the U.S. Um, so I want to focus now on uh, milestones and the CCC. Pretty much everybody had implemented their milestones uh, by the time this uh, survey occurred. And the, by far the most difficult milestone uh, that PDs uh, had to implement was healthcare economics, as you can uh, see on the slide. Um, program director's view of the milestone evaluation process at the time of the fall survey. Uh, over a third thought it was too long and uh, faculty not accurately completing confusing wording, 20% and 22% uh, uh, too long, which results in fewer comments, with 20% provided added detail that has been helpful. Impact on the milestones on resident preparedness for the uh, job market, a little over three quarters thought there was no difference in resident preparedness uh, for the current job market uh, that the residents are, are in. Faculty understanding of the milestones, a uh, little over half, little understanding with a quarter considerable understanding and 20% uh, no interest in learning the milestones. So we all have those staff, I think, and know who they are. Um, how do the residents feel about the milestones as of the uh, fall survey? Um, ambivalent was three quarters uh, of the respondents, according to PDs. Was there enough data to revise the milestones? They were up for uh, review at the time, uh, all over the map. The most common answer was not sure what to suggest, and the rest divided between not enough data to consider revisions and there is enough data to consider revisions. If you were to re revise them, by far and away, healthcare economics, again, was the most common uh, one up for revision, with a tie between all the milestones should be overhauled and quality improvement. Should additional milestones be considered? Uh, no, and uh, uh, was the most common answer. And, uh, <laughs> and there you have it. <laughs> so should additional milestones be considered? I won't read all these in the interest of time. My favorite one at the bottom is, please, no more changes. Please, I beg you. <laughs> Is the benefit of the milestone CCC worth the time and effort required in amassing resident data and conducting semi-annual CC reviews, creating assessment tools, and performing semi-annual milestone assessments? And from the length of the question, the answer is no, I guess, and uh, not sure, and about 20% uh, yes. 
Okay. Is the benefit and so several write-in comments. Um, CCC is hugely beneficial. Second one at the bottom, we have several struggling residents uh, having more input from different sources rather than the PD making uh, decisions have been hugely helpful. Um, the one above, some annual committee could could occur just as easily without them. And the bottom, the most beneficial aspect has been getting input on resident performance that no one uh, seems to write down but is willing to talk about in a dedicated meeting. So lots of comments right in. So CCC has helped identify residents at risk. Finally, something positive. Agree. So 40% uh, there and strongly agree, a little over 10. So. Um, CCC's effect on the PD authority. Most thought that the CCC function uh, uh, fully complements the, the authority of the program director. So switch gears a little bit and talk about uh, protected time. Pro program directors are asking for more protected time for their uh, to, for residency functions, and as programs get larger, um, they're asking for uh, more protected time than they currently have. Um, how adequately are you being compensated as a PD for your duties? No compensation or benefits, half the country. Adequate, 23%. Inadequate, uh, 17 So there you have it. Um, Non-program duties aside to your coordinator, about a little under 40% uh, had no additional duties, and the rest divided between one and three days. So a little bit on IR residency, and Angelise will have a lot more information on that on the spring. Most funding was being transferred from the DR program, with only 5% of slots for the IR residency at this time were coming from new funding, where 12% was a combination of the two. Plans for recruitment, most are going to uh, provide a mix of allowable pathways. Uh, into uh, the IR residency with the first candidates interviewing between the 2014 academic year and the 2015 academic year. Uh, educational curricula for call preparation. What do you do for your residents in preparation for call? Half the country has a formal didact have formal didactic lectures and a pre-call exam with 20% uh, uh, no exam and then the combination uh, of other choices as you see on the slide. Resident participation in interdisciplinary conferences. Half the country assist their faculty and do present uh, interdisciplinary conferences. 20% uh, uh, do it on their own, and then uh, 23 company faculty, but don't don't present the conferences. Uh, incentives offered to faculty for your scholarly activity. Uh, no incentive was the uh, the most common choice, and the. The next leading two were tied to promotion with inadequate financial compensation and tied to promotion with adequate at the bottom, around 20% for both. How would you grade your understanding of the self-study program? Uh, a third of the country is substantial knowledge. Uh, another third have some knowledge, and those who date is must be far out. I have no idea what needs to be done. So would you support national curriculum and best practice materials uh, by your Supporting organizations, you can see on the slide the different topics that uh, the responses were very strong: healthcare, economics, patient safety, non-interpretive skills, uh, curriculum uh, pattern after the ABR guideline uh, for the core exam, and so people were very positive on wanting uh, more materials in order to run their residencies by our supporting uh, bodies. So, writing comments: um, yes, help our do our jobs uh, in the area where productivity trumps all else. Available but not required for curricula, don't need any more rules. Um, other specialties uh, produce best practice materials for the program, so utilize in all areas, this would be helpful. So some write, representative writing comments. Do all the ACG mandates interfere with the creativity in, in regards to running a program? Uh, a little over 60% said yes, and uh, around 10% said no. Programs with rotations specific to the transition to private practice for fourth-year residents. Uh, this is about a third of the country uh, have, a, have a specific uh, rotations in their fourth year um, for that function. Let's talk a little bit about the exams. Okay, how are your fourth-year residents doing? Uh, the most common, about half the country, 48%. While we have some stars, I'm overall disappointed with the efforts and performance of the fourth-years. They don't appear to be actively reading, and conference attendance is poor. 
And then coming in a little over a third, the majority of our fourth-year residents are enthusiastic, striving to perform at the fellowship level and actively reading. So a little bit divided there in their responses. Is the core exam a fair assessment of residents' knowledge after three years? Yes, 40 percent, and nearly 40 percent not sure, and 20 percent no. Third-year residents now have a lack of focus on clinical duties and request time from the reading room. 91 percent said yes. So I wonder if we're causing some unintended consequences here with the core exam at the end of the third year, fourth years not wanting to be engaged, and third years now wanting to be on service. So something for discussion maybe. Has a new computer-based exam caused us to teach for the exam? Overwhelming response was uh, yes on that one. So have you implemented a department or division specific exam at the end of your fourth year? Uh, Ninety-five percent no. There's one person that has an oral exam that must be passed for graduation. I know who that is, but I won't violate that HIPAA violation. So classes exempt from the in-service would be uh, uh, the f fourth years and no exemptions with about uh, half the country. Uh, some of us on the committee were interested in how simulation is being used in diagnostic radiology, and uh, contrast reaction was by far the most common, followed by uh, different IR procedures. Uh, most had a, a simulation center within their institution, but very few have one within their own department. And those that uh, did uh, mostly did not work with other specialties, but those that did worked mostly with anesthesia and the emergency uh, department. So if you're if you were going to create an APR, APDR committee today, what would you, the name be and what would it focus on? These are representative writing comments. Uh, uh, a lot of people wrote in. Uh, creation of shared teaching and evaluation resources. Milestone replacement committee focused on no more than six. Uh, templates to help PDs keep up with a zillion requirements. Reestablish the oral boards. So lots of, lots of strong comments. Uh, Program director support, produce supportive materials and curricula to support PDs and programs. Uh, cur core curriculum exam committee, uh, uh, focus on teaching materials, a streamline and lesson every programs, continuing ACGME burden. Under a different question, what would you like to see provided by the APDR in support of your PD efforts? Uh, produce materials for program management, uh, ACGME uh, to increase the PD protected time tools for keeping track of requirements, and somebody writing in their department is required to generate enough income to be self-sufficient, and there's no support uh, for the PD, and the PD under, is a lot of, under a lot of pressure to, to justify his salary nationwide curriculum. So other comments, more administrative time for the PDs, less AGME requirements. Uh, standard to faculty development program for new faculty members, which they would complete modules and do assessments and get a certificate program. Uh, so lots of interesting comments writing in. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Appreciate it. All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Angelisa Paladin, and I'm going to be taking us through the spring program director survey. So here we go. First, I want to just honor the committee members that helped put these questions uh, together. I want to give a shout out to Anna, who wrote the paper that's just been published in Academic Radiology, which is a lot of work. Uh, and so thank you, Anna. So the spring uh, survey format, so we did a confidential online survey using SurveyMonkey. We used multiple choice questions, simple and multiple answer, and then free text for additional comments. The survey was sent to 306 active members, and I wanted you to know that 118 members completed this survey, so about 30 percent, 30, pardon me, 39 percent of our active members. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the program details so you know who responded. So uh, not surprisingly, about 84% are university or university affiliate based, 15% community. The program size was divided up between about 50-50 between small and medium and larger programs. Half of our respondents were from the East Coast, 37 from the Midwest, and 15% from the West. 
So I'm going to take us through medical student electives, IR residency, international medical graduates, call coverage, and our favorite case logs, right? All right. So let's start with medical students. So does your institution have a required radiology clerkship? So about 65% said yes. The second most popular answer was optional, and what that meant was the that they didn't have a required clerkship, but rather their institution has an optional clerkship, uh, with very few not having an option. So this was interesting. So at our institutions, the medical students are required to attend lectures. So almost 90% of the time, they're attending lectures and reporting to our different rotations. About a little bit over 60% are giving uh, a presentation. Uh, most are being evaluated by the director or by multiple uh, faculty. Um, most are taking a final exam, and I thought the one that was most interesting was the sign-in. So less than about 40% of us are only having our medical students sign in. The responsibility uh, for teaching medical students, so about 64% are having them give lectures. About half of those are volunteer versus assigned, uh, whereas a third are having them teach at the workstation only. So once they're in our department, what are they doing? So 70% are doing observation only, and then the rest are doing film interpretation, discussing their differential, and presenting their findings. So that's something we're going to come back to. And then our faculty given dedicated time, 65% responded yes, 35% no. And then we were really curious about what we're letting our residents do, pardon me, our medical students do during the IR rotation. So about 40% are having them scrub in and participate. About a third are having them scrub in and observe. Uh, and then very few are observer or patient care only. So our teaching material, uh, about over half have a formal curriculum. Uh, about a third have a random series of lectures. And then we're using textbooks and online videos. So this is another interesting question. PD impression about our impact. So 62% are positive, but 30% of those that responded felt that our clerkship may have a negative impact on the medical students rotating. Okay, we're going to switch to the IR residency. So when are you planning? So as you know, some of us were a little surprised. There are uh, institutions that are starting their IR residency this year. Most of us are starting in 2017 and 2018 with a few waiting for the rest of us to show us uh, you know, how it turns out, I think. So some of the roadblocks that people are admitting to is just the uncertainty of what it's gonna, how it's going to occur and how it will work. Uh, people, half of the respondents were worried about funding. Um, not surprisingly, a little bit over a third were overwhelmed with other residency duties and were uh, taking on another responsibility. And then the, uh, another strong proponent of lack of current residency spots. So the general feeling of, of IR residency was about a third I think we're moving in the right direction. About a third are not, don't have feelings either way. And a quarter think that we're moving in the right, not moving in the right direction. And I think the most important response was uh, a lot of program directors didn't understand why we weren't just moving to a two-year fellowship. They felt that that would have been a much easier route than what we are doing, what we're currently doing with the IR residency. So how are you promoting the IR residency to medical students? So uh, a lot of us are presenting at radiology interest groups. Um, 45% of us have not started promoting uh, the IR residency. We're promoting it during cl uh, clerkship teaching sessions, IR fairs, and then I'm going to show you some other uh, ideas for those of you who may not have uh, started to advertise. You can start a VIR interest group uh, during your interviews. It would be a great time to mention it when you're giving ultrasound workshops. So these are all suggestions made by our our respondents uh, having an IR, someone's doing an IR symposium. So there's some great ideas. If you're beginning a new IRDR, how are you handling the administrative duties? I think a lot of us were concerned that our administrative uh, coordinators already had a lot of responsibility. Um, so almost half are incorporating it into that uh, current administrator. Uh, the others are assigning it to the fellowship uh, administrator. A few are starting to hire a new a uh, separate IR program administrator, or give their uh, assistant, give a assistant coordinator to their present coordinator. 
All right, we're going to turn our attention now to international uh, medical graduates. So 30% have experience training IMGs, 70% do not. And then in your experience, what best characterizes the average IMG performance at the beginning? So about half felt they performed just as well, 36% not as well. Um, but this was interesting. By the end of the residency, almost 80% felt that they're performing just as well. The barriers that people were stating is the visa issues were a major issue for a lot of people. The, other ma uh, the top two reasons were the visa and the difficulty verifying quality of previous training. Uh, another high concern was that if they had a high percentage of IMGs, they, had, they wor worried that their program would be identified as less desirable. All right, let's talk a little bit about resident recruitment in our new environment. So regarding the recruitment of residents to your program in recent matches, 53% felt the overall quality of the applicant pool has gone down. 35% thought it was stable and fundamentally strong, uh, with a smaller percent saying it's improved. Have you gone uh, down farther in your rank list compared to five, 10 years ago? So 70% of us responded yes. Um, 25% said no, and a very few lucky souls said they're improving their match. <laughs> have you increased the number of interviews? So since they're going farther down, have you uh, increased the number of interviews? And 61% have admitted yes, they are increasing their number of interviews. Uh, and then we asked if you are, how many, and mostly it's 10 to 20%. But a few programs are interviewing up to 50% more. And if you think about that significant cost, significant time, I think that's a huge deal. And then because it's diversity, which is just this wonderful um, theme this year, we wanted to ask, do you have strategies to place, in place to recruit underrepresented minorities? Almost 64% of us said no. And the ones that did say yes, they are inviting minorities for interviews at a greater rate, or they offer preferential evaluation, um, and they have some people have diversity recruitment days. So some, just some ideas for those that are. We're going to talk a little bit about call coverage, because I'm sure a lot of you have noticed a shift into more faculty participation. And so we wanted to give you an idea of just how, what that scope looks like at this time. So do residents still take independent overnight call at your institution? So almost 70% are saying yes, 22% said no. Are you offering Nighthawk? So 10% of programs are, are doing that, so majority are not at this time. Do you have faculty providing overnight in-house ED coverage? So this is where we start to see some changes in statistics. So 34% um, say yes, 43% are no, but 13% are, are considering. So almost an even split if you, uh, if you include the considering as to faculty providing coverage at night. And now we see a larger distribution of faculty, residents and faculty are in-house together for a portion of the call shift, so 41%. The majority are, are, are in together, whereas 33% are with the residents doing most, if not all, with the fellow as backup. We wanted to see how the VA hospitals were being, um, how their call coverage were uh, being covered, and it's interesting, so 35% the resident is covering using teleradiology. A quarter of the VA faculty they own, uh, are taking call, and a quarter are the Nighthawk. So this is where the majority of our Nighthawk coverage is coming, um, is, is the VA hospital coverage. Case logs. So as a member of leadership, how often are you re uh, are reviewing them? So every six months was the most popular answer, which is the right answer since it's a requirement, right? <laughs> Uh, how does your program collect resident case log data? So most of us are uh, using both our coordinators and our radiology ITs to help us with that. Uh, so this is what I wanted to share with you, and it was good to hear from others around the country because I think a lot of us are struggling with this. So a lot of us are reporting insufficient IT support. We have to merge data from multiple sites, and it's uh, the insufficient capture rate related to multiple residents dictating on one um, dictation. And then the one thing I wanted to point out was the CPT codes used by ACGME are um, capturing less than what our residents are doing. 
And just two miscellaneous questions. Do you perceive a conflict between service and education? So as our RVUs are going up, and half of us are saying yes, so we're about an equal split, half are saying no. So there's 60, almost 60 percent of us are uh, evaluating our, the accuracy of our residents uh, against a final signed report. So that's a great knowledge to have. So if you're interested in that, be asking your colleagues this week. And leadership development, 60 percent are offering leadership development for PDs at their institution and about 50 percent for their coordinators and administrators. And then the most structured curriculum that we have, it seems to be quality assurance, professionalism, health economics, and ethics, and less so for global health, patient-centered care, diversity, and inclusion. But a lot of wealth here that we, I think a lot of us would like to share our best practices. So it seems like there's a lot of great curriculum out there that we need to tap into. And what would you like to see provided by the APDR? Uh, a lot of people commented on structured curriculums to help them, more best practices. And overwhelming, we see a lot of turnover in PDs in the last couple of years, and so new PDs are asking for support. And so just my takeaways or food for thought as I went through this survey, with numbers of quality, qualified candidates in radiology decreasing, should be, be doing more than observership for the medical student rotation. How are we going to advertise our new IR residency? 80% of PDs who have trained IMGs feel their performance is equal to U.S. graduates. Um, for those that are not interviewing them, we should probably start considering. 65% uh, do not have special strategies for recruiting underrepresented minorities. Should our specialty be doing more? The national trend is for increasing faculty coverage at night. How is this affecting our resident education? And our ACGME case log data is not accurately capturing what our residents are doing. Does this matter? So, and finally, I just want to thank, I want to give a special uh, shout out to my coordinators, Marcus and Amanda. Uh, without them, this, I would not have been able to put this presentation together. And they worked really hard with me on this, so thank you. And also, a very special um, shout out to all the program coordinators in the audience. Uh, we really value everything you do. So thank you. And then we go to change session. Change session, 7 a.m. And then Anna Rosenstein. All day. Yes. That's me, but only today. Is it going to start? Okay. So it's going to start. Okay. So our next speaker is Anna Rosenstein. Oops, that's good. Cool. She's going to be giving us an update. I hope that's fixed there. On the NM, NRMP. Um, update. So, Anna. Thank you very much. Now, why this is on the slide, I have no idea, but let's just. Uh, thank you for being here. It's. Uh, that's okay. It doesn't. I'm not sure. You know, this time, this year, first time, I have several disclosures to make. This presentation was partially funded by you, by your money. It's the first year where the APDR felt that we needed additional information from the NRMP, uh, the institution which seems to be somewhat stingy with information, with data, and uh, the uh, APDR uh, funded part of this work. I also have to tell you that this is the most stressful presentation ever, every year, because um, if you remember, the match was on the, 20, on the 18th. It's been, what, about 10 days? I just got the uh, data uh, from the search that the NRMP did for the EPDR, specifically an hour before I left for the airport. And this lecture, no, I'm, I'm it's true, you know. They just sent it to me, you know. They sent me gobbledygook on Friday, which made me completely paranoid, had to rerun it, gave me a mistake on Monday morning, and finally corrected it Monday afternoon. So all this is made on the bumpy flight from JFK to San Diego, okay? So if you see a lot of typos, please try not to boo very loudly, okay? So let's, you know, keep the booing to the, to the end. All right, so I have to tell you that the report is based 
based on the limited advanced data tables in 2006 by the NRMP. And I can tell you, those of you who have looked at those PDFs, the data is confusing. And the numbers, you know, I've done this for years now, and I've gone through every single table, every single number. Numbers frequently don't add up from one table to the other because the definitions that NRMP applies vary slightly, okay? And therefore, they tell us that they could be within, you know, within like a percent or two, okay? So this is not absolutely exact science there. Also, the full data from the SOAP is only going to be available uh, in May, okay? And so, um, you know, you will probably see it in print before I speak to you next year. I would like to acknowledge my matching plan committee members, particularly Ernie Wiggins, who cannot be with us uh, this year because he has a clinical emergency, uh, who spent enormous amount of money. Ernie and I, for example, spent the entire last summer going with pen and pencil through the, the, the data to analyze it. The APDR leadership who understood the importance of the you know, emergency searches immediately after match and funded uh, this talk. And May Lang, director of research at the NRMP, who last year did the searches for us free of charge because she understood the importance of it. Okay. So I bring you somewhat you know, rosy news this match. I think a lot of us felt certain amount of you know, recovery. We've mentioned the medical economics, and RMP basically shows us, it's a, it's a mirror of the healthcare economics as pertains in this, question, in this uh, instance to radiology. This is our uh, entry-level job market clearing house. And we are seeing uh, signs of economic recovery. We had, in 2015, we had 64 unfilled programs. This year, it's only 30. All this data is before SOAP. I do not have SOAP data, okay? Now, last year, there were 150 unfilled positions before SOAP. This year, it's only 45. Now, only it's, you know, only it's for you folks it's not going to be only if you haven't filled your position. It's really expensive and difficult and stressful to go through SOAP. Okay, but still, you know, 150 to 45, that is a big improvement. We are also seeing a very important sign. In 2015, only 56% of our positions were filled by the U.S. medical students. This year, it is 67, this percent. This is a big bump. Why is this important? U.S. medical students are, for whatever reason, we'll get to that in a moment, our most desirable applicants. We know that overall, their match rate, okay, the rate at which they match to a program, is over 90% consistently. So they, you know, really, if you're a U.S. medical student, you're almost guaranteed to match. Okay. At the same time, the rate when the independent applicants match, and these are the DOs, the international medical graduates, citizens and non-citizens, etc., is much lower. DOs match at approximately 70% rate. U.S. citizen IMGs match at around 54% rate, and the non-U.S. citizen IMGs match at 40-something, 40 45 or something like that, depending on the year. Why is this important? Well, if you have a lot of folks who are independent, they're going to, for example, have a problem matching into the internship. We'll get there in a moment. Okay, and so we've had this problem last year, and the problem is continuing. Okay, so why is it getting better? Because we simply have more applicants for our positions. Please know that last year, which was somewhat of a disaster, we came to almost parity. These numbers, by the way, are slightly artificial. The NRMP doesn't tell us how many applicants we've got. It just doesn't. So what we do, the committee does, is we use the pool of applicants applying to the advanced PGY2 programs as the overall pool, because the majority of these folks are also going to apply to the categorical programs. And so that is a really good proxy. But please note that it came almost to parity. We had a problem. And this year, we got a little better. Okay? 
not as good as we were in 2009, but we certainly a little better. So who are the applicants that came back to us? It looks like that the U.S. medical students are going up. The independent applicants are, well, if not stable, but certainly the number is not increasing the same way. It's the U.S. medical students that are rediscovering radiology. And this is what we are seeing. So this is the fill rate. Uh, the question here is, is this growing desirability of the specialty or more applicants in the main match? We all know that the uh, number of uh, medical students in the United States is increasing. Okay? We, we all heard about that. And so why is this question important? Because if the specialty is more desirable, okay, then we're going to get more competitive and more committed applicants. Now, if the tide, rising tide, you know, lifts all boats, that may not necessarily be true. So we looked at the total applicant pool, and we've noticed that comparing to 2015, there was slight expansion in the total pool of the entire United States. So United States medical students were up by less than 1%, 6% on the IMGs in the, uh, of U.S. citizens, and so on and so forth. However, if you look at us, we dropped from 2013 to 2015 by approximately fifths in the advanced programs and went up by approximately fifths in one year. So this certainly is not what's happening in the main match. This is desirability of our specialty. And the same, by the way, is happening in the categorical programs, a dip over two years and then a rise. So this is the desirability of our specialty. Okay, so we've seen that at least this year, our applicants are coming back. Where are they coming from? It's also important. Please note that the red is this year. Okay? So we've actually have done much better together with rehab. And so we, we are taking the positions on the advanced front from anesthesia, dermatology, radonc, and on the categorical front, we are sort of you know, taking a little bit, they're coming back to us, a little bit from surgery, a little bit from peds, and so on and so forth. Okay, so the internship question. Uh, you know, immediately after the 2015 match, I started getting phone calls uh, telling me that it's the first year we had a problem that our applicants who matched to radiology, advanced positions, could not get an internship. Why? Because the ACGME had the new rule at that point, which said that all radiology residents beginning training in 2016 had to complete the ACGME accredited internship. And I had 10 days to call the interim P, and they, I begged them, literally, and they did a search for me. And they discovered that there were 47 applicants who uh, matched to an advanced radiology position and did not have an internship after SOAP. This was after SOAP. And uh, I would like to credit Jim Anderson and the RRC who worked very hard on this and the ACGME postponed the requirement for one year. So it was really important for us to see what happened this year. Uh, we thought, we predicted that whoever could in prob you know, the programs that had this issue, that whoever could would convert their positions to categorical positions from advanced. And in fact, it happened. If you notice, the number of this combined number of advanced and categorical positions is pretty much the same. But the categoricals are getting the more of them and advanced fewer, but the number, you know, it's a, a zero-sum game. And so this year, the search went out, and uh, eventually, uh, the first answer I got from them, from the NRMP, was 122 people. And I panicked. And then they had to do another search. And the actual correct number is 26. So this year, we have 26 applicants who matched to radiology that did not have an internship after SOAP. Add to that the adaptation of 18 positions which switched from the advanced to categorical and you have approximately the same number. So this problem did not go away. It got ameliorated by adaptation, but uh, the fact that we have somewhat you know, more U.S. medical students did not impact these programs. We still have a problem.
Okay. Uh, now, it's getting warmer, right? So it's, you know, we're seeing that the match is not quite as difficult. Maybe we're looking at the recovery. There's some warming signs. Will you, as a program director in your program, will you feel it? Well, actually, that's going to depend on location. Uh, this data is not published. One of the three papers that this committee is writing is already traveling, waiting for its home, okay? Two are in various stages of preparation. You're hearing this right now. Uh, all programs are equal. Some programs are more equal than others. And uh, what you're seeing here is a um, Dartmouth atlas of uh, NRMP, basically. This is what we actually... Uh, uh, found. So, for example, <clears throat> you are seeing at the num you're, you're looking at the number of U.S. medical students matching to a state, not just in radiology, in all specialties. So, for example, uh, uh, Utah, Oregon, and Washington have a lot of U.S. medical students. At the same time, Nevada has very few medical students. And so we wrote um, a proprietary program which allowed us to siphon this enormous amount of data, tens and maybe hundreds of thousands of points from, you know, years and years of archives of the NRMP and convert them into Excel spreadsheets. And I will, this, you're, you're not having a moment of hangover. It really is somewhat blurred because this is what I got literally last night from my medical student. I wanted to show it to you. So this average U.S. fill rates by state over the past decade, not radiology, all U.S. medical students, it's incredibly stable. For the United States, in the last 10 years, the percent of U.S. medical students filling the training positions in all specialties is about 66, about 66 percent. And the states are also very stable, and the variability is enormous. Utah is at 87 percent on average hovers about 85, 87, 88. Nevada, let's do Wyoming, is 16%. Hovers, you know, 15, 16, etc. And so you can actually see what happens, and this is the mark of a desirability of a location for U.S. medical students. Radiology is somewhat different because we are, first of all, some states just don't have radiology programs. And also, we are, um, uh, in radiology, we, we're fluctuating, right? This is a zero-sum uh, zero game. Uh, some years we'll have more U.S. medical students, some years we're going to have less. And so we looked at radiology over the course of 10 years, and I will show you a few graphs. This is always the average. The bars are always the average. When we separated the states, us, okay, into basically four categories, uh, the states that make the trend and the states that defy the trend and the states that don't feel quite as well. So the trend-defying states are approximately, you know, U.S. medical students match that at the rate of 80 percent. It's all for radiology most of the time. And you are California, Indiana, North Carolina, Rhode Island, and Washington state. Okay. The high-filling states, you are seeing the trend. Actually, there is a downward trend, so certainly. But you're staying approximately 10% higher than the mean for the majority of years. And this is Colorado, New Mexico, Texas, District of Columbia, Oregon, Vermont, Maryland, Tennessee, and Virginia. Okay. The majority of us are going to make the trend. Who are we? That's who we are, including us in New York uh, State. Okay. Some states are fluctuating probably because of the very small number of radiology positions, but if you put them together, average them, they still make the same trend, so we're going to keep them with trendsetters. And then there are states that are suffering, the low-filling states, that's where U.S. medical students don't really like going. And by the way, that parallels what we see you know, across the country. It's not you or your programs. It is the location. And these are Connecticut, Oklahoma, Ohio, Kentucky, Arkansas, Mississippi, Louisiana, Delaware, New Jersey, New Hampshire. Please note New Jersey, the state where I trained. Um, and this is 2015 zero U.S. medical students that went to radiology in New Jersey. Okay, so uh, this is a Dartmouth atlas of uh, an RMP, and it's a Dartmouth atlas of radiology. 
Physicians do tend to practice where they train. There is significant amount of data and good data on the subject. And therefore, what we are seeing is this, is this effect is certainly going to affect composition of our future workforce, talking about medical economics. Will this affect quality? Does composition affect quality? And the answer is uh, there's just a lot of data on performance, a lot of data on performance. We know, at least the data shows, that U.S. citizen IMGs, so international medical graduates who are U.S. citizens, when to train elsewhere, do not perform as well on tests and in clinical practice as U.S., as non-U.S. citizen IMGs, foreigners who come in here to do the residency training, and U.S. MDs. Okay? For example, in the ICU setting, in the entire state of Pennsylvania, the uh, non-U.S. citizen IMGs were 16% lower in mortality of their patients than the U.S. citizen IMGs, and 7% lower than U.S. trained MDs. Okay? So this cohort of the non-citizen IMGs performs extremely well, and if you've just, you have reported the same on your survey. Talking about another proxy for quality that we can actually see from the NRMP website, approximately every two or three years, the NRMP gives us the USMLE scores by applicant type, and fortunately for us, all of our applicants, U.S. medical students and the uh, independent applicants are still, no matter what, are higher than the mean. Okay? So we're still doing well here. To conclude, the applicant pool, at least this year, is expanding. We have a long way to go to the high of 2009. We have no idea what kind of shape this particular recession is going to take. Is it going to be a V-shaped recession? With recovery with, you know, re really quick recovery, is it going to be a U-shape sitting like this, or is it going to rise a little bit and then stabilize? We don't know. But the matching plan committee is watching it closely. We'll present it to you. We will publish it. The papers will be coming out. Um, and location matters. So when you compare the performance of your program, you have to consider uh, the climate, the economic climate overall, and desirability of your location to U.S. medical students. And that's all so far that I'd like to share with you. Thank you very much. So our next speaker is Edward Blauf from um, Oxner uh, Clinic Foundation, and he's going to be giving us an update on the job market. Uh, thank you very much. Um, appreciate the opportunity of sharing this information. I have to apologize, however, in advance. Uh, I wasn't as fortunate to be able to crunch numbers as quickly as our previous speaker, and I, I'm astounded that she was. We are in the process of analyzing our 2016 survey, uh, which I will have ready to present at the ACR annual meeting, which is taking place in May. Uh, so in the present time, uh, what I'm reporting on is really last year's data, uh, but it's sort of a very nice corollary and in, in, in integration with the previous information that we have. So for information purposes, uh, since I've become chairman of the Human Resources Commission, we've started an annual workforce survey, in, which is sent to the chairman or head of the group of approximately 1,700 different radiology groups in the country. Now, as a matter of information uh, for you, when I started the survey five years ago, uh, there were around 2,100 groups. We're now down to around 1,700 We're related to probably mergers and acquisitions and some groups just uh, being sold to hospital bases and merged in that capacity as well. So the survey is not seen by everyone in the group. The survey is only seen by the chairman or head of the group who fills that survey out. And primarily what we're asking in the survey is what's the makeup of the current workforce? Who did you hire last year? Who do you think you're going to hire 
next year in terms of what type of specialty and who do you plan to hire potentially in three years. And we know that that three-year data is much less accurate than the, the data about who did you hire last year, who, what is your current makeup of your survey uh, force, and who do you plan to hire uh, next year. So we have that information. And what we, for 20, uh, 15, what we had is we had 39% of all uh, radiology groups uh, uh, responded. 32% uh, of all the heads of groups responded. This year, actually, I believe it's 34%. So we had slightly improved. Uh, I do have some numbers from this year, but not the, the total. But we have around a third of the uh, groups uh, responding. Uh, which represents 39% of all radiologists. Again, uh, uh, the head of a group represents all the members of that uh, radiology group. We also collect data for radiology technologists and uh, mid-level practitioners as well. So this represents, uh, again, as uh, I've said, a, uh, a significant number of radiologists, so I think the survey is valid and worthwhile. We have a geographic distribution as well, and it's interesting uh, considering the last speaker's uh, discussion about where people practice. So this is representative. Uh, we've divided the country into uh, the way the ACR represents them, which is, uh, frankly, the way one of the staff members sees the country. Uh, and uh, this is the makeup of the, uh, uh, of the respondents, which, again, is similar to the makeup of practices around the country. And we'll talk a little more about where the jobs are in relation to this, which is somewhat different than what we just heard a moment ago. Um, so if we look at the, uh, the current workforce, uh, you could see that around 50 to 55 percent are in private practice. And I want to remind everyone that uh, there's a difference between uh, just saying that you're private practice or academics. That's not the total picture. Academics represents around 20 percent of individuals who are not in private practice. Around 30% are in other forms of practices, which, which is the type of practice I'm in, which is a multi-specialty group practice, which is different than an academic practice with much less emphasis on academics. Um, there is a difference. There are now hospital-based employed physicians, around 20%, equal to the number of academic radiologists who are employees of a hospital not a hospital whose, whose physicians are in private practice, but purely an employee of that hospital. There are a large number of radiologists who we have underrepresented in our survey who are now working for a for-profit corporate entity. So it's a different type of practice. And, and I'd remind pro program directors, you need to train your individuals not simply for private practice or academics, but consider the wide spectrum of practices that radiologists are going into and, can, and adjust your programs accordingly. The uh, number of radiologists who uh, work uh, part-time are around a third, uh, or rather, excuse me, the number of practices that offer part-time work are around two-thirds, but for the radiologists, uh, only around 12 percent actually uh, work part-time. If we divide the uh, look at the uh, gender issues relating to the workforce, around 22 percent, 21, 22 percent of the radiologists are, are women. Uh, the majority are men, and we'll talk about that in a little more as well. But if we look at the issue of gender and working full time and part time, we see some disparity as well. Again, remember, 12 percent of the workforce in total is part time. 10 percent of men are part time. 24% of women are part-time, so it's a much larger percentage, which is statistically significant. If we look at another area is the age of the workforce, and this is rather surprising. I think when we started this workforce, and it's held steady ever since, we find that around 7% of the workforce is below the age of 35, and 7% equal is above the age of 65. So a significant number of radiologists are at the level of capable of retiring at any moment, uh, equal to the number of young physicians who are in it, who are in the, in, in the area. The majority of radiologists are in the uh, age group between 35 to 45 and 46 to 55. So that middle group was a majority, but there was a considerable number, around 2,500, who are over the age of 65 and still actively practicing. Now, again, if we look at the issue of gender, and I think it's important uh, that, to understand this, uh, if we look at the age of the group, I think we'll appreciate the difference in changing trend in radiology. There's a lot of angst, I think, among uh, individuals uh, uh, that uh, 
women are underrepresented. They are if we consider that 50 percent of the medical students are women, but you could see the trend is significantly increasing as a trend of increasing um, uh, as a tre trend of having an increased number of women in medical school classes have increased as well. So, and we've had done, done some work, and tomorrow I'll be presenting some work that the Human Resources Commission has done on what attracts medical students to radiology. And there is a difference by gender about what are the attributes that attract people to radiology. And that's part, I think, is part of the explanation. So, uh, just, I think, a take-home message very importantly is there's a significant increase in number of women in radiology in the younger age groups, uh, but it, and that, so therefore the, the 22 or 21 percent doesn't tell the whole story of uh, what the representation of radiology is. If you look at the type of work that, uh, uh, the type of subspecialty that radiologists are doing, and again, the chairman of the department or head of the practice uh, responded to this based why was the individual hired. We'll talk about how much work individuals do, but why was that individual hired? And for the first year in 2015, the largest number of radiologists who were hired are, uh, who are in the workforce presently are doing general body imaging. In contrast to before, uh, we had uh, the largest number were general radiologists. Uh, and obviously, the, uh, people capable of doing a little of everything. The next group is interventional, uh, general interventional, no radiology, uh, MSK. If we look at the trends, uh, the, it's a significant reduction in general radiologists in the current workforce. And I suspect that's related to the retirement of older radiologists or more commonly general radiologists. But uh, we've also seen a significant increase in those radiologists who are body imagers. So the most significant, largest percentage of radiologists in, an, in most practices are general body imagers. And that's statistically significant. If we looked at uh, part-time, and there's a difference also, if you're interested in part-time, and particularly we could see that there are a large number of people who are interested in doing it, the largest number of part-time jobs are as a general radiologist and as breast imagers and then followed by body imagers. Those are top three. If that's your goal, then, uh, then if you're a resident, then you should be considering that as the kind of training that you want. Now, very importantly, I think, is the issue uh, of how much time do you actually spend in your subspecialty? And I think this has important implications for the training programs as well as uh, for a, a, a level of satisfaction. What we found is that only 39% uh, of radiologists work more than 50% in the area of their specialty training. And only 18% uh, work more than 75%. The majority work far less. And again, I would remind program directors the implications for what you should be asking your residents to do in the fourth year is important based on what they're going to be doing in the future. Because there can be a mismatch between residents who are trained in only one focal area and capable of doing that versus people who are, in, who are trained in many areas. If we're looking at uh, people who are where they practice and what type of capability they have, uh, it's really only in academic practices where, more than, uh, where a large majority of individuals practice more than 75 percent in their subspecialty. So again, if you're a resident and you're here in this audience and you're considering um, wanting to practice in your subspecialty only, then you really have to plan for the 20 percent of groups who are in academics and not live under the assumption that you're going to be a focal specialist in a private practice. You can do that, but there are only 10 percent of people who are doing that high level of subspecialty. And in other areas, you could see that there are people who practice that way, but it's around a third of the people versus academics. So again, I think the information is what, where are you, how much of your subspecialty are you doing has implications for how we should be training our residents going forward. Well, let's look at the data for 2015. Uh, this was, uh, uh, in 2015, we asked, as we always ask, who did you hire last year? Because when we started the survey, we had no data, and we wanted to be certain that we were accurate. We predicted then that we were going to have around 1,100, 1,200 jobs. Turned out, actually, 2015 was a little better. It wasn't good, but it was a little better than we had predicted. It was 1,300. If you remember that there were around 1,200 finishing residents every year, 
And they're not the only people looking for jobs. There are people in consolidation, consolidated groups who are now looking for jobs. There are individuals who are unhappy in their present situation and are looking for jobs. But these are the total number of jobs that existed. So we had a match, actually. Uh, once again, it showed that our survey was, while a little varied, it was statistically significant. We've taken the attitude that we really need to, rather than come up with a specific number, because I, I got a bit of criticism last uh, two years ago when uh, I said that there were 1,180 jobs, and they said, well, I'm the 1,181st. And I, I realized that it was rather foolish uh, to just come up with a specific number. So we decided to change this and made a range. So in, 20, uh, so in 2014, the range really is between 1,300 and 1,700 jobs which were avail available. And I think that sounds actually a little better when, again, you're one of the 1,200 residents who are finishing. It can tell you that there is a little more optimism uh, than exists. So what about 2015? This was what we predicted in 2015. Who would you be hiring in 2015? And the answer was around uh, 1,100, 1,200 to 1,500 jobs. My gestalt, uh, and this is not for quote, but I will have specific numbers, is that actually the workforce has improved this year. And I think we'll see actually better numbers than this prediction. I think in 2015 there were more people hired uh, than this number, but we'll come up, come up with an actual number, which, I, again, I will be presenting at the ACR meeting in May. If we look at who, was, who did people plan to hire in 2015, the largest number were interventional, general interventionalists, followed by, uh, which were 14 percent, followed by breast imagers, uh, body imagers, uh, and neuroradiologists. And those are the top four of the groups, and followed by a sprinkling of all others. If we look at uh, 2018, again, I think these are much less accurate. We've, we've learned that they're less accurate, but just it gives residents an idea of where to plan. I think the numbers are relatively similar, except oddly enough, uh, general radiologists were considered in a, high, a higher number, and I'm not sure why that was, but I don't expect that's going to pan out in actual data when we actually get to 2018 and the hiring takes place. If we look at, and this is sort of interesting, if we look at where were the jobs, uh, which is a correlation of what we heard in the earlier talk, the largest number of jobs are in the south, and I found that odd because the mismatch uh, that you talked about where the residents least likely to match, it seemed the majority of the least likely places to match were in the south, but the majority, the largest number of jobs were in the south. Uh, the least number of jobs are in the Northeast. And with all the training programs are in the Northeast, it's another, it's another correlation. Turned out actually the mid-Atlantic area was with the big bump where unexpectedly there were more jobs in mid-Atlantic area in 2015 than we had predicted. For the type of practice system, largest number are private practice, but for the first time if you added all the, all the jobs together and divided, the, the largest number were not private practice. The largest number were other areas of employment, whether it was academics, whether it was multi-specialty group practices, et cetera. And I think importantly to know is that the workforce survey starting last year appeared to be increasing, and I think it's going to increase as again. One other point I want to uh, bring up, uh, we did another survey, uh, some other, we do supplemental questions in our survey, and last year we asked uh, about who do people want to hire. And again, I emphasize this, these are the people who are making the decisions about who they will hire. So who do they want to hire? What's the most desirable candidate for hire? So the choices were a single specialty radiologist, which meant someone who potentially would be doing a uh, um, their fourth year doing focused uh, time in their subspecialty and in their uh, fellowship would do a, the same fellowship and capable of really working in that area. The other, uh, the next group was a, uh, someone who did a fellowship but then particularly chained in the fourth year in many areas of radiology and was capable of doing large areas of general radiology and a single subspecialty. Uh, the multi-specialty radiologist was someone who did two fellowships in many fellowships in the fourth year. We talked about that a few years ago, and then did a, a different fellowship in their uh, fellowship year. And then the general radiologist who didn't go on to do a fellowship at all. Who did people want to hire? The largest number of the people wanted to hire was a, someone who did a fellowship but was now capable of doing general radiology as well to supplement and fill in the schedule. 
That's the reality. That's what people want. So again, I would urge you, in your fourth year, it shouldn't be one or two mini fellowships. It really has to be a general radiology education so that person is capable of doing that. And this goes out to all areas, even including academics, uh, interestingly enough. Uh, so these are the most, uh, again, the most uh, desirable lo locations, uh, desirable type of people to hire. So first, just to move along, since I'm a little over time, uh, just to conclude, the survey d demonstrated that the projections from 2014 were accurate. Hopefully, our 2015 data will be proven as accurate as well. Um, we predicted in, that there would be around uh, 1,100 to 1,500 jobs in 2015, uh, and it showed that hiring appears to have increased. Uh, again, I remind everyone that the workforce needs may change because as the environment becomes less attractive to older radiologists to continue working, they're going to be leaving the workforce. It's not a matter of economics. That's not why the older radiologists are working. They're working for many other reasons, and they could leave if they desired. And if we make it unpleasant for them, they will. Um, <laughs> so if you want more jobs in your area, that's a way to do it. Uh, there are few, uh, fewer than 40, uh, a reminder, fewer than 40 percent of radiologists practice more than 50 percent of time in their subspecialty. Again, that's a very important message to pass on to your residents and your fellows. Uh, there appears to be an increased percentage of female radiologists in the younger age groups, and I think that trend will continue, and the number of female radiologists generally in radiology will continue to significantly increase. Most job opportunities appear to be in the South, and that is a trend that has continued over the five years, and the least number of jobs are in New England and the Southwest. And there continue to be more job openings in private practice than academic universities in 2015. And again, uh, I've m made this statement, uh, residents quote me on this, uh, there are jobs available, but they may not be in the area that people want to work as their first choice geographically or the type of practice that they expected that they would be working on in the future. There are sadly jobs as nighttime Nighthawk radiologists, which I think no one who graduated cum laude from an Ivy League university expected that they'd be working from 12 to 8 in the morning. So there are problems in our workforce which continue to exist. Even though jobs exist, the type of jobs may not be the kind of jobs that individuals want, and we need to be uh, cognizant of that as we continue. So, but optimistically, um, the um, work, the number of jobs is increasing. Thank you very much. So the spinal speaker of uh, this session is uh, Dr. Uh, Bendy from uh, Boston University, and he'll be talking about uh, milestone, the Milestones curriculum for healthcare economics. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Um, this is a quick update. They sort of squeezed the 10 minutes into this session. There wasn't a lot of other space for it in the program, but thank you for having me. Um, I want to give an update on the project that we started last year. Um, so, you know, we all know all this. Uh, the NAS and the systems-based practice and the milestones, that we, we don't need to belabor that. Um, so healthcare economics, I mean, we've already heard a little bit on it being sort of the most desirable, uh, one of the most difficult uh, topics to teach. We saw a slide on that. And one of the more desired, uh, desired um, topics to have a centralized curriculum. So we all know it's difficult to do, and that's why we sort of took this on um, as a project to see if we could create something that we could use um, across the landscape here. So we do have the healthcare economics milestones, which you see there. All of you are very familiar with that. So, you know, some of the commonly faced problems that we, we noted were there's a ton of resources out there. We all know there's way too much stuff out there to have to sort out as a program director and then package and deliver to your residents and assess. So it's a real problem with resources. I mean, in one way, resources are great, but there's a lot of noise out there to have to sort through. Um, there's no assessment to satisfy necessarily. Not all programs have the faculty or the necessary resources to teach the milestones in healthcare economics. Um, there is a lack of resident interest to some degree, especially now with things being packed into three years and how much clinical radiology they need to learn. Um, 
there's not a lot of interest in, in this space. It's almost one of those things that you just got to get it done. Unfortunately, because I think it's an extremely important space to know. Um, and there's a lack of specific curriculum. So what are we thinking are some possible solutions? So we could develop a well-rounded curriculum with high quality resources um, designed by sort of content leaders in our field. Um, utilize periodic assessments to demonstrate an increase in knowledge and competency of the healthcare economics and a feasible option for those residency programs without the faculty or resources to develop their own curriculum. That's our goal. Um, design a comprehensive interactive program. So those who know me know that I'm into different ways of teaching and feel very strongly about group learning and interactive learning and active learning um, as a delivery method rather than just passive learning. So we wanted to model this on newer learning practices and almost like an MBA style format. I don't know if you remember last year I presented some slides. We are using an MBA style program to teach the healthcare economics milestones. We are in no way, I sort of showed the slide of the, the Pawtucket Red Sox. It's the minor league team that we have. It's not, it's not the one we field at Fenway. So we are the Pawtucket of uh, the healthcare economics MBA thing. Uh, we're not claiming to be an MBA program by any stretch, but we like to use their system in small group learning uh, as a model for this uh, particular uh, curriculum. And it's a very interactive experience. So we proposed this last year at the AUR, and we asked for volunteers to participate in the milestone pilot. We had an overwhelming response, and I want to thank all of the programs who approached me uh, and our, um, our, our, our people to participate in the pilot. We had up to 30 programs probably interested in participating in the pilot. We had to narrow it down to five. And the reason we did that was because we needed as much uh, feedback and control over this pilot as possible to make sure it was going to run smoothly. We didn't want too many programs in it to be haphazard. So we felt like we picked a nice five cross-sectional group of radiology programs across the country to participate. And I'll get into that in just a second. So we launched the pilot in the fall of 2015. Um, development of a pilot curriculum based on the few milestones and uh, a multi-institutional pilot. So this is so the team that we assembled at Tufts. Uh, it was myself, Dr. Meehan, uh, who has an MBA background and one of my chief residents. And we joined forces with the Radiology Leadership Institute uh, Dr. Lexa, Anne-Marie Pasco, and Vicky Giannotti, uh, we as a team created a curriculum uh, to move forward. These are the institutions that participated in our pilot program. Uh, we did it at Tufts, uh, Mass General, Virginia Mason, Osner, and Dartmouth. Uh, we felt like that was a fairly good cross-section of very large institutions, smaller institutions, some that were, um, uh, anyway. So possible solutions, so uh, it was, I just want to explain the way we structured this. We vetted all the RLI content, which took, I, I don't know how many hours of uh, work this took, but all their webinars, all their content, and we bucketed them into the content that was relevant to our milestones. So the residents had what we call sort of self-paced activities. We identified some lectures and, and articles that they would read ahead of time, and they were given an assignment. That assignment, then, they would break up into small groups and carry out that assignment and discuss it at their home institutions with, with a person we designated as a moderator for this pilot program at each institution. The, uh, the, the, the moderator would navigate through this case study that we gave the residents, and they, um, in a live webinar, after they did the case study and discussed it in their homegrown, in their, in their residency programs, Dr. Lexa conducted a live webinar of all five institutions at one time, and everybody presented their data in a five to ten minute presentation. The case that we uh, proposed for this pilot was uh, reimbursement of an uncontrasted head CT, and uh, they'd have to identify their pair mixes. They'd have to know how is that reimbursed in an ER setting, in an outpatient setting, in an inpatient setting. So they all met with their business managers and got all these data on the reimbursement of a non-contrasted head CT, and they presented those data to the group on a live webinar with Dr. Lexa. Um, and we had periodic assessments as an example of uh, the session that we had at Tufts, and uh, this is a live webinar that we conducted. And um, I have to say the discussion and the energy in the room when other institutions were presenting their data 
Um, it was more than I had ever been able to discuss as a resident um, when I was training. So it was quite an amazing discussion. Some of the feedback that we got about the pilot um, surveyed participating residents and group moderators at the conclusion of the pilot was very well received. 100% of respondents agreed that the pilot met the objective of addressing how reimbursement works and how business terminology applies to the particular institutions. Here's some of the comments we got from the residents. Resident material was informative. I enjoyed the group discussion, especially the online wrap-up session with other programs. Overview of the process involved in billing and reimbursements was very good. Be very helpful in future application. And on the healthcare economics education, it's a definite weakness that needs to be addressed in residency programs. Some of the comments that we got from the moderators in the groups. Format was great. Begin with self-study, then met as a group locally to discuss and reinforce central topics, then application of the knowledge gained through the project, and finally reinforcement of the themes of the final WebEx conference. Very effective way to teach the concept. Uh, engaging multiple uh, diverse programs, content was well laid out. So we are now taking it to the next level um, this year, and we are going to develop a full program for this space. Um, we used our pilot feedback to enhance the program. We're going to address all five healthcare economic milestones as, as part of the program, and we're going to maintain that blended interactive program design, and we're sort of um, packaging it as a turnkey for program directors. Um, it's a statement that says, designed to satisfy the ACGME systems-based practice competency requirement by effectively facilitating resident education in healthcare economics. This is the way the program is going to be structured this year. We're going to launch it in 2016. It's a seven-month block. Uh, over seven months, we will have five blocks that address all five milestones. September, October, each of those areas will address a single milestone as we move forward. So there'll be five, five sessions, each of which address each milestone. Each session will be essentially conducted in the same way. Residents will be given pre-learning content. They'll also be given a case that's being designed by one of our subject matter experts. Um, that case will uh, be navigated in small groups, and the moderator will conduct a discussion based on that case. Ultimately, they'll create a presentation, and they will have a live webinar with one of the content the subject matter experts to discuss their findings in each of those cases. So we are trying to be very sensitive in this timeline. We're ending this program in March um, because we want to be sensitive to the core exam. That's going to start, uh, they're going to start studying for that. We also want to be sensitive to junior residents who may be getting ready to take call and uh, getting anxious about that experience. So we felt like after March, participation might drop uh, because of other responsibilities. So we're ending it in March. Again, that's the basic design of all five blocks. So it's open to all levels of residents and fellows. It is not free. I, I knew it was going to come to that. Uh, it is not free. Uh, it is I, uh, being done at cost. However, from the RLI, um, it's delivered uh, as a service to residency programs. We are limiting it, the initial thing, again, just to keep this manageable if there is a big... Um, sort of, uh, uh, if there's some enthusiasm, um, to 20 programs. Um, this is something probably that you'll cycle once every four years, by the way, because we expect all residents, regardless if they're first or fourth year residents, to participate at the same time. So um, it will cycle every four years for you, if you uh, want to participate. So that's the update. I appreciate you giving me the time to give it. and. Um, that's all I have. And uh, by the way, there will be a booth outside. Uh, Melanie is uh, at a booth to discuss more details about the program uh, if you have any further questions about it. By the way, at the very end, just so you know, there will be uh, there are assessments after the end of each block, which are five blocks. At the very end, there will be a multiple choice test to give you final sort of assessment of the entire program. So that's all I have. Thank you. Sorry for the wrong affiliation. <laughs> okay, I think we have about five or six minutes. We're running a little bit over for um, questions. So if anybody has any questions or comments, they can come up to the microphone. And the speakers will be available at the end of the uh, morning sessions to um, meet with people if they have any specific questions. Nolan? Hi, hi, uh, Nolan Kigetsu, Mount Sinai. Uh, uh, regarding the uh, workforce, uh, I thought that was a great slide regarding uh, women 
uh, looks promising. The uh, number of women is, or percentage of women is increasing. I thought it was actually kind of curious because the, uh, you showed that under age 35, there's 32% women. Uh, I have recent data from ACGME that shows that only 26% of uh, residents currently are women. So perhaps uh, we lost some ground or, or whatever. And I was wondering, do you have a similar slide for underrepresented minorities? Or if not, do we, could we get one for next year? Uh, we don't have that information. Actually, it, we're, we're running into difficulty trying to identify that. Uh, the issue is, um, in the issue of uh, minority representation, uh, when someone is, when it's not being self-identified, it's very difficult to be certain what actually the ethnicity of the person represents. So that's the problem that we, so since our survey, the methodology, is being directed by the head of the group, that person didn't feel, in a, in a small survey of, heads and chairman, that person didn't feel that they'd be able to actually represent their group. Maybe that's a good thing in a way if you think about that they don't really know the diversity. Uh, they're hiring the best candidate. But that may be something we need to get to later. Maybe we need to do something as an intermediate step. But we don't have that. We haven't been able to figure out how to do that. And if, I would appreciate if anyone has uh, a, another recommendation or how to uh, develop that data or how to ask that question, we certainly are open to, uh, to your I mean, I, I would suppose if you did a survey and you could put an asterisk, these are people that self-represented, you certainly have the minimum, and then you, you know, but right, it but could I, be greater than that. Right, but our methodology, remember, is the head of the group is the only one who sees it or fills it out. I see. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, I guess we'll be back in about... Uh, 10 minutes for the next session.